hello everybody and uh, thank you Sarah and Warren for having this conference and by I'm going to talk about control theory and experimental psychology <clears throat> which is basically what I've been <laughs> working on for 30 years. So I, I will be talking about what we call our basic tracking experiment which is uh, what got me into this in the first place and then I'm going to I, I finally realized in the last uh, year or so, after getting a couple of papers rejected, which isn't a new experience, but uh, having uh, learned that the reason people don't quite get this is because they don't see the relevance of this tracking study to, um, to um, what they do in their experiments. So I think a lot of people, and especially experimental psychologists or scientific psychologists, whatever they want to call themselves, don't really see the relevance of that to what they do when they get an experiment. So I'm going to try to show what that is, and then I'm going to talk about, so I'll talk about how some uh, just four classic experiments uh, would be looked at from a control theory perspective, and then I'll talk about finally what I think the implications of all this is for how we do um, experimental psychology. Okay, this was an experiment that Bill Powers described in a 1978 paper that he published in Psych Review that just blew my mind. And, uh, but anyway, the, uh, I think you know what uh, I'm showing you here with this uh, diagram, but the, the, basic, the basic compensatory tracking task uh, is, is this situation where the human, the person, the subject, is looking at that top line is a stationary target line and the bottom line is a movable cursor that's being pushed around by this disturbance which is equivalent to the independent variable in an experiment because it's independent of what the subject does and it's also influenced by what the subject does that's the mouse movement over here on the behavior side so and the, the subject's task is to keep that lower line aligned with the target by moving the uh, the mouse and uh, people can do that after a little practice quite well and uh, what's amazing at least to me about it is uh, well this little task this little tracking task uh, the simple little task to me or in that paper Bill described how that task illustrates the failure of what's I call the general linear model, which if you're a research psychologist, you know that's, that's the basis of all experimental research in psychology. It's, it's the basis of all of the statistical tests that are done and all that. It's the, it's the model that assumes that the dependent variable in your behavior is, a, is caused by the, ultimately by variations in the independent variable. So, but this, uh, this little tracking experiment shows that that model is wrong, at least when you're looking at a closed loop system like this. The next chart shows why this tracking task uh, uh, shows that the, the, the basic general linear model or causal model of behavior fails. And that's, uh, if you just look at the diagram, what you find in this tracking task always, once a person is able to do it, is that the correlation between the disturbance, the independent variable and the dependent variable, is something on the order of minus 0.99. That just shows that the, your behavior is compensated or negatively related to the pushes on that lower line. That's kind of, I think that's what, that's, I believe, what Bill showed in two dimensions. When you're, when you're tracing out hello with your behavior over here in the dependent variable, it's because the independent variable was the inverse of hello, basically. Uh, not the inverse, the... Uh, but anyway, uh, so what's, but what's amazing about that is that high correlation between the independent variable and the dependent variable is that you can't see, the subject can't see the independent variable. All the subject sees is the controlled input, the difference between the target and cursor. And it turns, and that's called I, I call that variable I. And the correlation between that variable I and the independent variable, which is pushing it, is virtually zero. And the same thing is true, and that thing that really blew me away and blows everybody away and nobody believes, is that the correlation between the, independent, the input variable, the thing that the subject sees, and what the subject does, the dependent variable, that correlation is also virtually zero. So that's, 
that's uh, completely inconsistent with the, uh, not only with the general linear model, but most people's intuitions about how this task is done. So that's uh, one thing that you find in this, uh, uh, very surprising to me, I think, to most people, it's a very surprising thing, and, and scientific psychologists, when they, I'm sure when they read that paper, quickly try to explain it away in some way. But anyway, that's one thing that, that, that kind of the simple tracking test shows that the general linear model fails with the, when you're dealing with a closed loop system. And then the next slide shows the behavioral illusion, which is a little tricky to understand, but basically what the behavioral illusion is, is that in that diagram, what I'm showing in the chart, rather, is, is a plot of the relationship between the independent and dependent variable. The red line is, a, is that negative correlation of 0.99. That's what you see as the relationship between the independent and dependent variable when the function relating the, what's called the feedback function, when the function relating the behavior to the input is a linear function. Uh, the behavioral illusion is that if you, if you, is that the, this uh, chart showing the independent variable, dependent variable relationship, it, it would, it looks to anybody like that's, that's uh, the function that describes the, the kind of the transfer function relating input to output in a, in a human. That's kind of the, the, uh, the psychological function. Well, it turns out that the shape of that function depends not on the nature of the brain in there, that human, it's, it depends on the, the nature of the feedback connection from the behavior itself to the, to the, to the input. And that's those two little equations. The, the top equation is the, is the linear equation relating the input variable to the dependent variable. And, that's, and when, you, when you do this tracking task with the linear function, you get a linear relationship between the independent and dependent variable. But if you change just the environmental connection from the hand, the behavior, to the input, to a cubic function, you get this uh, inverse, it turns out. This is, that black line is the inverse cubic function. So what the behavioral illusion is, is that, uh, that, that the relationship between independent and dependent variables is, tells you something about the nature of, got it, okay, the person. Okay, so uh, let me, so those are the two things that the tracking test shows, and that basically, those two things uh, just blow away uh, the basis of experimental psychology, but of course, the, the experimental psychology hasn't gone away. So the next um, chart just shows that the results of this simple tracking test challenge the foundations of experimental psychology, but what I found is that critics, that's my reviewers who re review the papers I write about this, um, say, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, so that's what you find with a, in a tracking task where it's obviously a closed loop situation, but that's not what's going on in psychology experiments because psychology experiments look to be open loop, and that's what I'm going to show you next. I'm going to look at, the, let's go to the next chart. I'm going to look at four experiments real quickly, because they've got a short time, and just show you uh, how uh, that actually, uh, and this is kind of what I finally figured out in the last few months, really, that these, uh, these experiments that look open loop are actually closed loop. So let's look at a reaction time experiment. That's the next slide. The top part of that is the way a reaction time experiment looks to most people and most experimental psychologists. You get, uh, in a reaction time experiment, the, the independent variable is whether the light is on and off. That's what the experimenter controls. The person is, is asked to press a button as soon as the light comes on and don't pre press it when the light comes off. So it, and so it looks like the behavior in that task looks like open loop. You, the uh, stimulus or independent variable comes on, behavior happens. What, what is actually happening, I think, with uh, the control or closed loop view is that when you've given the subject the instructions to press the button when the light comes on and not press it when it's off, You've asked them to control a logical, ver a logical relationship between what what they see and what they do, and that's and and you're, you're asked the subject is asked to have a, in a sense a reference for having that logical relationship be true. In other words, they want it to be true that when the light comes on, 
the, the button is pressed, and when the light goes off, the button is not pressed. So in a, uh, the control theory view is that you know a reaction time task is a closed loop task where the subject is controlling an input that is a little hard to see, but it's the relationship between the independent variable and their own behavior. Okay, now let's go to another uh, magnitude estimation. You might not be familiar with this task. The next task is a kind of simple, basic, uh, uh, perceptual task. The subject uh, is asked to, to say a number that's uh, the size of the number is proportional to the intensity of the, of the sensation they get when you play, say, a tone certain. From the causal view, the upper one, it looks like as the tone intensity goes up, it causes bigger numbers to come out of the person. But uh, the control view, I, I think what's going on in a magnitude estimation test is also a closed loop situation. You're asking the person to have a goal of, um, I just lost my audience, but <laughs> um, I, I have to have the goal of keeping the number they produce equal to the, in, the, their perception of the intensity of the tone. So again, it's a closed loop task. Uh, this is the classic, classical conditioning experiment, but this is just the unconditioned stimulus part. But in, in the beginning of the classical conditioning uh, experiment, you put food in a dog's mouth, I guess it's food powder, and out pops uh, salivation measured in a fistula attached to the, um, to the dog's mouth. So it looks like food causes salivation. That's the classical view. What I think is going on is that uh, the, dogs are controlling the viscosity of the um, bolus, the food in their mouth. So when you put dry food in a dog's mouth, its behavior is to salivate, and the salivation, one of the, one of the reasons it salivates is to make the uh, food swallowable. So it's again, it's a control task. That, that apparent causal reflex is a, is a, control, a closed loop control thing. And finally, I'll, I'll look at this one last thing is the, the Ash conformity experiment because that's a little higher level experiment. Uh, there's one subject and, uh, who's a stooge and uh, they're asked, and all the subjects are asked to estimate the length of the line. Everybody calls the line that's clearly longer or shorter. And so then they ask the, the subject and he's uh, often the subject goes along with the peer pressure. So it looks like all the peer pressure is causing behavior. But again, in that situation, I think what's happening is that the, the, the people control more than one thing uh, in, in all circumstances, of course. And so in this particular experiment, uh, most subjects are controlling not only for uh, being consistent with their peers, probably, but also being accurate in what they say. So there, there's probably a conflict. So uh, this, is, this is highly simplified, but the point is just to show that in this kind of experiment, people are controlling what looks like stimulus response or independent variable open loop behavior, I would say is also closed loop. So let's go to the next slide. So what are the implications of this? The implications for me are that I would suggest experimental research should have some, should be reoriented. The experimental, <laughs> it's a big boat to change. But what I would suggest is that uh, the aim of experimental psychology should be at determining what people's, what people's purposes are, what their control variables are. That's what a purpose is to a control theorist. And uh, also to map out a part, big part of control theory, as you would certainly know in this conference, is that uh, we imagine that people are controlling a hierarchy of purposes. And I think another goal of research should be to try to map that out. So, the, last, the next slide just goes through this, what I think is kind of the, one of the basic procedures of the new experimental psychology would be testing for controlled variables. I don't want to go through this whole thing, but I'll just say that uh, the, the new procedure would be somewhat different than the old procedure in that what you're looking for instead of a response to an independent variable would be lack of response of a, of a hypothetical control variable to the disturbances you produce. And that's the test for the control variable. And I'll just finish up the last slide, which is what I think is new and what I think might be of interest to you, is I think that a, uh, an interesting part of a new research program would be mapping the hierarchy based on using the uh, data, basically data from the method of levels.